He is an American biology professor at the University of Minnesota Morris, working on evolutionary developmental biology questions using zebrafish. He is the author of the award-winning Pharyngula Science blog, hosted on the Free Thought Blogs Network, and a columnist for Free Inquiry, published by the Center for Inquiry. A self-avowed, godless liberal, and outspoken atheist, he is a public critic of the intelligent design creationism movement and an activist in the American creation evolution controversy. In 2006, Pharyngula was listed by Nature as the top-ranked blog written by a scientist. He is the recipient of the 2009 Humanist of the Year Award and the International Humanist Award in 2011. Please welcome P.Z. Myers. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about American education. I, by that I mean United States education. I know this is North America too, but uh, th because this, this is what I know is, is the American education system. And I kind of view my job here right now as preliminary, that what I want to do is I want to set up this panel discussion that we're going to have with Eugenie and, and Larry, because as you'll see, I'm going to actually end this with a set of questions, and I'm hoping they'll answer them. And if they can't answer them, you guys will provide the answers, right? So yeah, I'm asking the questions. You guys give me, that's, it's a reversal of the usual Q&A, but it will work. It will. It will. I promise. Uh, so what I want to do for a bit is I want to look at the big picture of science education in your lovely neighbor to the south, because that's where I live. And that's where science, or rather, I should say scientific ignorance, uh, played a big role in our recent elections. And it will also be playing a role in our future. And to do this pro to introduce this problem, I want you to, I want you to meet, uh, Allen, Texas. Look at that football stadium. That is a gorgeous football stadium built in the city of Allen, Texas. Uh, Allen is this booming northern suburb of Dallas, if you don't know exactly where that is. And it's part of the usual prosperous ring of suburban satellite communities that surround big cities. I'm, you have those in Canada too. You know, it's, it's a fairly common sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's a rich little town. Median household income is almost $100,000. It's growing, and responsible civic leaders want to continue that growth. And so what they did is they made the city an attractive one by building this $60 million football stadium for high school football. High school football. Now, I know this is Texas, OK? You're saying, oh, yeah, OK. That, that's not surprising. Um, but still, you know, think about $60 million for a school district and they spend it on this great big arena so that their students can indulge in all kinds of massive brain trauma <laughs> instead of education. But here, here's the point I want to make about it. It's, it's no boondoggle, all right? This is not literally a misappropriation of funds. The citizens of Allen voted for a property tax levy specifically to build this stadium. They went into this with open eyes. It was put on a ballot. They said, will you appropriate X amount of, of money from your property taxes in order to build uh, this gigantic stadium? Stadium. It was in the news all over the place. There, They were well aware of exactly what they were get, getting. Um, and as you can see, you know, it's, it's a really well-used facility. Apparently, in Allen, Texas, you need a $60 million facility to handle a population of 84,000 people who want to go to watch football games at high school. So, you know, we have to face a fact here, and that's that if we're going to be democratic, if we're going to respect the wishes of a community, and we're going to allow them to invest as they see fit, People will choose to build football stadiums rather than, for instance, hiring more science teachers. That's going to happen all over the place. And I, I choose to open up with this example because, you know, the panel is full of cranky old atheists like me and Larry and more sensible atheists like Eugenie. And, um, 
It's always tempting for us to just blame everything on religion, because clearly religion is a major force behind creationism. We can't deny it. And I'm all for fighting religion as, as promoting bullshit. Uh, but we have to be clear about one thing. If religion vanished from the United States tomorrow, we'd still be facing huge problems in getting support for science education. Atheism is not a panacea. I think it's part of the solution. It helps, but it's not going to solve all the problems. You see, the problem is that Americans don't understand science. And worse, this I consider the worst problem, is they don't care about science. If we could correct that second problem of disinterest, the first problem would solve itself because people would go out and pursue science they would be voting to build $60 million research facilities in their high schools instead of football stadiums, because that's what they would want. And that's our problem, is getting people to want this stuff. You can't promote science by telling people that they must learn it, or there's a common strategy now, telling them it's good for them and will increase their salary prospects after they graduate. Uh, that's the castor oil approach to teaching science. And it's, it's saying, it's icky, but it's good for you. And that does not inspire students to be enthusiastic. You see, you don't, you don't learn science by having it shouted at you. You learn it by doing it and actually discovering for yourself how fun and powerful it is. Uh, this is really our big challenge as science educators, is how do we get people to realize how much fun science is, and how exciting it is to learn new things and change your mind about ideas. Now, another bad way to produce good scientists is to declare it a matter of national prestige. And boy, do we get a lot of that in the United States. It's actually the main line the Democrats use. You know, I'm sure you're all familiar. The Republicans are, are pretty much the anti-science party in the United States. And the Democrats are nominally pro-science. But the way they do this is they talk about how we are such a technological nation, which is true. We are dependent on technology. And that we need science to solve looming problems in energy, medicine, climate, whatever. And that's also true. But that's not an approach that entices enthusiastic and inquiring minds to science. That's a very practical, pragmatic approach to it. It's not about science as a process for pure learning. And it also relies on some common American propaganda, uh, which I know you Canadians don't fall for. I really should be giving this to an American audience. They're the ones who need to hear this. But I'm going to go over it anyway. And I want to give you a very, very brief, truncated history of American science. Um, because what we often hear is that America is the greatest superpower in the world, the greatest scientific source of knowledge on the planet. While we hear that, I don't think you guys hear it up here that much. Probably not. Well, anyway, we hear this over and over and over again. And we are told that this over and over and again. And it's not true, unfortunately, for us. Uh, the scientific veneer in the United States is actually relatively thin. Uh, until well after World War II, the United States was not regarded as a technological country at all. We had a loose network of state universities that were created by something called the Morrill Land Grant Act of 1862, which was actually a very utilitarian law that set aside land in each state as an endowment for a university system. That's our land grant colleges, like the University of Minnesota that I'm at. And initially, most of these schools followed a predictable path. They typically had two major functions. One was the training of public school teachers, and the other was to work as an ag school to train farmers. That's what America is, is a big breadbasket, land of farming. Research, actual re scientific research, was a luxury that was carried out largely by prestigious Eastern private universities but it wasn't a big part of the land-grant colleges, not at first. Uh, there was also no central direction. There was no presidential committee saying, here's the things we need to work on to solve problems in the future. 
Um, and there was very little disbursement of research money to the, to the colleges. Before World War II, something like 70% of all federal money dedicated to research, which was pretty tiny to begin with, went to 10% of the universities in the country. And most of them were on the East Coast, a few in California. And that was kind of it. Now, when World War II started, the U.S. was not seen as a source of technology by the European powers, but purely as a source of manpower and factories. That's what we were good at. We had these mobs of people. We had industry. Uh, we could, they could go to work building things for the allies in Europe. We did not bring better airplanes or high-tech weapons into play. That wasn't our role. We didn't have that capability. Uh, we provided troops and we provided assembly lines. That was our job. This was also true after the war. Now again, in the United States, we get this myth all the time that we won World War II, right? Uh, we won World War II in the sense that we provided lots of cannon fodder. Uh, but Really, then, you know, this, this was a world war and it was everybody contributing to it. Um, and after the war, while we could sit there and thump our chests and say, oh, we were so powerful, we did so much, uh, the, the actual powers that be in the United States, the people who run the government, were acutely aware of the fact that compared to the United Kingdom and Germany, the United States was a backward little country. We had nowhere near the research facilities. We had nowhere near the technological expertise that the United Kingdom had, to, had. And we also did things like steal lots of German scientists to bring smart guys over to our country to do the work for us. Science was planted in the United States as an actual act of will. It was a political decision to implement science education in our country. Uh, the big name I, I will name here that many people have never heard of, it's Vannevar Bush who in 1950 established the National Science Foundation, which was a central federal institute that was in charge of dispensing research money, guiding research, and also a key part of this was enhancing the public education in science. It was a conscious decision by a Republican government in the United States that we needed to build up the educational infrastructure. And again, it was, a, it was a coldly practical sort of decision that what we needed was to emphasize a pipeline to generate people who were capable of building a technological country. So, you know, these schools were seen, public schools were seen as part of a pipeline. We were still, we're still building assembly lines to turn out scientists now instead of of B-52 bombers. But let's not have any illusions here. We currently have an excellent research apparatus in the U.S., not because of native talent for science in the American population, but because hard practical men created a network of assembly lines to crank out research, just as they created a network of factories to turn out jeeps and bombers in World War II. That's where we stand. Now you might ask, Jeeps and bombers, yeah, where are those factories now? Uh, we call it the Rust Belt. Our industri industrial cap capacity is declining with disuse, and the same thing can happen to our research capacity. I, I can't emphasize enough how fragile the scienti scientific apparatus of any modern state actually is. It's extremely sensitive to the vagaries of funding and to public opinion. And this is the scary thing about the United States. We're coasting by on past glories and relying on an infrastructure built in past boom times and not investing in bettering our situation right now. So I'll show you a perfect example here. This is the I-35 bridge collapse in Minneapolis in 2007. You know, this, this is where I live near there, well, a few hours away from there. Uh, the I-35 bridge is, is a major traffic artery in uh, the Minneapolis area. In fact, that happens to be the bridge that gets you to the university from downtown Minneapolis. So it's, it's got this very deep connection to the university system there. 
And uh, one day in 2007, it simply fell down. Just boom, it collapsed. It killed something like 15 people, injured 100 and something. Uh, it was just this sudden traumatic disaster that happened. And no, there was no severe weather. There was nothing happening. It was just people commuting across the bridge and boom, pancake down into the river. Now, this event supposedly alerted us to the fact that there's something rotten going on. Uh, it should have alerted us to that, and we've been getting warnings for a long time before. Hi highway engineers have been saying for years that the nation's in maintenance of the bridges was deplorable. The American Society of Civil Engineers had given America's infrastructure a grade of D minus in 2005. We had the warnings. This happened in 2007, and the engineers had been waving their hands and shouting at us. Uh, there's a big problem here in the United States. We've got to fix this. So anyway, we, they also said we had 18,000 bridges in desperate need of repair at that time. The I-35 bridge has now been replaced and repaired. Hooray. I can get back to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities now when I want to. And now in 2012, five years after the collapse, the ASCA, ASCE reviewed the national infrastructure once again and gave us a grade. And what do you think it was? D minus, yes. And we now have more than 18,000 bridges in need of desperate repair. The U.S. spends 2.4% of its gross domestic product on infrastructure maintenance. In Europe, they spend 5%. In China, they spend 9%. The U.S. is ranks 23rd in the world for infrastructure quality. It falls somewhere between Spain and Chile. Spain has better infrastructure than the United States. This is not something we tend to brag about, right? Uh, we are not that glittering high-tech paradise we want to pretend to be. Uh, you know these notorious results that... Uh, there's a famous name on that paper. Anyway, you know these results. You know They showed that the U.S. acceptance of evolution was really low and that the only country we beat was Turkey, right? That's not an outlier. It's not just evolution. Evolution is not our only problem in the United States. Uh, we're behind in many things, and we keep collapsing all kinds of bridges. Here's another example. Uh, this one's kind of personal for me. It's, it's our mass transit system. Uh, you know, we're living in this era where we have a decline in fuel availability uh, with soaring gas prices, and we have growing concerns about things like carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and in the United States, we don't give a damn about how we're moving people about. You got a car, you drive, that's how you get there. In Morris, as I've said, I, I live in this little town of Morris. It's three hours from Minneapolis. It's way out in the rural areas. Uh, and I, you know, I, I talk to the old timers there and they, they talk about the 1960s, you know, the old days, 1960s and 70s, when the train station in Morris was the center of town. That was where you communicated with the world is you could go down to the train station and something like four times a day there was a train passing through and you could get to Minneapolis, you could get to Fargo, you could get to Sioux Falls, any of these places in the area. You can't do that anymore. The train station is all shuttered and boarded up. You talk to most people in town, you know, you've, it's like you've got to be over 60 years old and you vividly remember the importance of the train station. You talk to any of the young people, they can't even tell you where it is. It's somewhere along the train tracks, right? Yeah, that's about it. It's pathetic. And, you know, here I've got this three hour drive to the airport. Like every other weekend, I'm going to the airport. I have to get in a car and do this. Why can't I get on a train? Why aren't the trains running? And the reason is, is that we've allowed the tracks to degrade so much they're no longer rated for passenger traffic. They, they only allow freight traffic on them because they're so unreliable and bumpy. And there's no effort, of course, to repair these. We're just going to let them fall further and further apart while we're struggling to maintain our freeways. And this is symptomatic. It's all over the country. It's misplaced priorities that we have to struggle against in order to improve the place. And nobody wants to. We can all pretend these problems don't exist. So 
where we're throwing our money is always going in the wrong directions. Now, I mentioned the example of that Allen Texas Stadium, but I can show you another example. Uh, these are organizations you may be familiar with. Uh, this is the annual budgets from 2008 for a couple of organizations. There's Answers in Genesis, almost $25 million. There's the Institute for Creation Research. There's Discovery Institute, Reasons to Believe, and Creation Science Evangelism. And over there, in its own little color of blue, there's the National Center for Science Education. <laughs> yes. Just imagine if we could flip those around and, and Eugenie Scott had $25 million to play with every year. <laughs> yes. This, this is what we need is we need to, we need to change our priorities. But once again, you know, this is, this is not a matter of mandatory decision making that's going on here. That what this is is that people elect to give their money to Ken Ham rather than Eugenie Scott. Now, I can't imagine why, but they do. And what are we going to do about this? And it's, again, it's, it's not solely a problem of creationism, though, or religious fundamentalism. It's all across the board that we're, we've got these misplaced priorities that are, that are undermining the advancement of science. And here's, here's another example. Uh, this is, this is the crisis in American education that's going on right now. Those institutions that good old Republican Vannevar Bush put in the front line of science education are being slowly starved to death. State and federal money are flowing far less freely to the university system in the United States. Uh, what's happening is that more and more of the day-to-day -day costs of running the university are falling not on grants from the state, not on grants from the federal government, but on the pockets of our students who have to pay increasing tuition costs. That over the last several years, we've seen many cases where we get these double-digit percentage increases in tuition costs per year, which is pretty much intolerable. You can't keep that up for very long. And you know, this, this is extreme, this is typical all across the country. We, we've got the same graphs I could show you for Minnesota where we're seeing exactly the same thing. We go to the state gov government every year. We ask for money just to maintain what we have in place, not to expand, not to, not to turn us into a giant conglomerate of universities, but just to maintain what we've got. And every year the budget's cut, cut, cut. And then in response, we have to do is raise it on our students. What we're witnessing are increasing economic disparities. You have to be fairly well off to be able to afford higher education now. Either that or you have to saddle, saddle yourself with massive loans in order to get through college. And yeah, you know, when I graduated from college, I graduated with something like $500 in debt. This was in the 70s. Um, I had a student loan. They expect me to pay back at the rate of $15 a year. You know, the interest rate was something negligible. I could get more money just by throwing it in a savings account. Um, I just, I didn't bother paying it off for so long just because, you know, it just kept keep trickling out because there was no profit in, in paying it off. Uh, that's not true for students now. They graduate now with ten, fifty, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 in debt from their college educations. Again, this is not supportable. This is not a good way to start a career is in massive debt where now all of a sudden you're thinking, uh, okay, I've got $50,000 in debt. Do I want to go off and be a graduate student and study biochemistry with Larry Moran? Who would pay, yes. who would pay diddly squat? <laughs> $25,000. Yeah, see? <laughs> or do I want to go into private industry? Do I want to, do I want to get a job in a pharmacy company? Do I want to do something like that where I'm doing a purely applied research? And a lot of students are making the easy decision. It's very unfortunate. And it has another insidious effect that I've noticed over the years. Increasing numbers of our students are not there because they love learning, because they love science, but because they come from upper and middle cl income class families. And they have this desire to maintain that economic status, which means acquiring a professional degree. That here I am, I'm teaching biology, and they see it simply as a stepping stone to getting that certificate so they can get the big salaries. 
So I spend a lot, a lot of time teaching people who want to be doctors and dentists. And it's not to say that there's anything wrong with that. Those, those are good occupations. We need them. They're, they're important members of the community. Uh, but these are not the people who will expand the scientific base of the country. Now, there's another fundamental problem with funding science education in the United States. Allen, Texas, as I mentioned, has this comfortable surplus of large tax base. It allows them to sink $60 million into a football stadium. But if you look around Dallas at other schools, uh, this, for instance, is the North Dallas High School. It doesn't look quite as shiny, does it? And it's not. Uh, some of those Allen suburbanites probably drive right by, by this North Dallas school on their way to work in, these, in the big city. Uh, North Hi Dallas High School is currently in its fifth continuous year of having an academic rating of unacceptable by the Texas Education Agency, which in Texas basically means they discourage you from going there. They say, you've now got the option. You can leave this crappy school and go somewhere else. Unfortunately, they do not provide any funds for transport from to a new school district, so you're kind of on your own there, and many students can't afford to take this, especially if you're in a troubled school district. You can't pay for this kind of service. Um, and what it also means is that the, these schools have a declining attendance. Fewer and fewer students are going there because of their horrible rating. Um, and funding to the school is based on student attendance. Wow, isn't that a nice catch-22? It means they're on the slippery slide to destruction. Um, if they, it, the, the law is that if they've been rated as academically un unacceptable for five years, uh, the agency can close it down, which is what may well happen here. So here you've got a school that's not doing a good job, and the answer is to deprive it of the tools it needs to improve its work. That's what we're doing. Now, they essentially trap this cohort of kids in a bad school. And if they don't get their academic standings measured up, they're going to screw them over yet again by shutting down the school altogether. But think about this. This school is about 20 miles from uh, the high school in Allen, Texas, the one with the $60 million football stadium. Uh, one has the capacity to fling millions of dollars at student athletics. The other is struggling for its existence. There is something deeply wrong about this situation. There are 48 schools in the Dallas School District who are rated as unacceptable. This is, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Um, you know, there are, there are roughly 4 million minds born every year in the United States. And whether they will be encouraged to develop and be trained to understand science depends to a remarkably high degree on precisely where they are born, what color their skin is, and how much money their parents make. And that is a deep injustice. But let me say something positive for a change. Yes, this has been a depressing talk, hasn't it? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I, I will say when, there's hope. There's, there's a way to fix this. Um, there, is, there was something that happened called the Minnesota Miracle. It happened in the 1970s. Uh, in the 1970s, I was a high school student and then a, a student at the University of Washington. So I was way on the other side of the country. And even I heard about this, that for a time, uh, Minnesota had this amazing reputation as the place to go for education, the place to live if you had kids and wanted them to get a good education. So um, what I heard about Minnesota was that it was this, this amazing place where teachers were respected and admired and paid and trained adequately, and all of them were above average. <laughs> it happens in Minnesota all the time. But when you dig into what the miracle actually was, it wasn't magic. Um, it was good politics and tax reform. The whole foundation of the sudden and strong uh, and very positive change was a state initiative to remove school funding from uh, the vagaries of a local property tax levy, which is how most schools are funded in the United States right now, and instead go to a system where money was dispersed as schools needed it from a central state repository, which was fun funded by a sales tax 
and by, cha uh, by a progressive uh, change in the income tax. So rich people paid a little more, it went into the central fund, and schools all over the, all over the state got a fair share of this money. And it had this amazingly invigorating effect. A simple change, a really strong influence, and it was a clear experiment that worked. It should have been a model for American education everywhere. Unfortunately, it had a side effect. It turns out that if you have a well-educated populace and promote teachers well, well, teachers and educated people tend not to vote Republican. <laughs> it's just a fact of life. Um, and it's not because Republicans are necessarily anti-education. I gotta emphasize this, that once upon a time, Republicans were the pro-science, pro-education party of the United States. They're the ones who shifted the emphasis in the U.S. to more science education. But because the current form of the Republican Party is deeply wedded to an ideological view of science, to the religious right, and to the short-term thinking of anti-environmentalism, thinking people do not vote for Republicans. So the Minnesota miracle has been slowly dismantled over the past few decades. Uh, its final dissolution was actually completed under our recent Republican governor, Tim Pawlenty, who some of you may have heard of if you follow American politics. He was briefly a candidate for the presidency, very briefly. He didn't last very long. Uh, in you know Minnesota, which by this time was a thoroughly blue state, knew him too well, and uh, his candidacy did not hold up for very long. They were, there was no way any of us Minnesotans were going to vote for that loon. Anyway. So there is educational reform that actually works. It's out there, it's been tested, it's been shown. This is an example we should be using. Um, it faces real political conflict, however, and it isn't, going to, uh, it isn't going to happen as long as the religious right can shut it down. And that's our choice right now. We can make changes that improve public education and science. This is possible, we can do it. Or we can do this. Uh, this is Bobby Jindal, the governor of Louisiana, who has a reputation among Republicans as an education candidate. I know, it's, it's bizarrely twisted, but he's thought to be a leading thinker in American uh, pol political reform of the educational system. Uh, but he's anything but. Uh, his, his latest scheme is a voucher system in Louisiana that opens the door to using state education funds to pay for for-profit, private schools and religious schools to take the place of public schools. It's the antithesis of the Minnesota miracle. It's the exact opposite of what we did in Minnesota. And they're trying it out in Louisiana right now. It's a plan that diminishes state support for public schools and even further, um, it exacerbates economic disparities. It gives more clout to religious prejudices, prejudices that oppose science teaching. And that's really the choice we have. We, ha we can have an anti-science, regressive, backwards-looking educational system, cheerfully and enthusiastically promoted by the religious right and the Republican Party, which is what we've got going on right now. Or we could have a progressive, open educational system that gives everyone more access and more opportunities, which in America right now is promoted by no political party at all. <laughs> So we're in this sad state where we're, we're facing this dilemma where we're not seeing a pro-education candidate anywhere at work. Oh, I'm sure there are at the local levels. We've got to get them, we gotta get them up in it higher and higher, but we're working on that. Okay, so let me close there. And what I want to do is, I, like I said, I, I threaten to leave questions for our distinguished panel to answer. And so let me throw some questions at you guys. Um, here's a big one is, you know, we can't tell people you've got to, you've got to take science classes. You've got to enjoy science. You will enjoy mathematics. No, that doesn't work. Uh, so how can we inspire students to be enthusiastic about science? How can we teach them that this is really cool stuff and get them so that they are self learners? Then we got to figure out how can we persuade the electorate to fund science? Now, we could presumably do the first part and wait a generation, but you know, we got a chicken and egg situation here. We gotta get this going now so we can get the generation, the next generation to be science-minded. So we gotta work on that. How can we correct the economic disparities to open the door to more scientists? 
uh, it's all well and good to say we're only going to let in upper middle class people, but then uh, that's shrinking the base of potential scientists. And as I mentioned, uh, those people often aren't the best. They're, they've got other priorities, and, and science isn't always one of them. Another question is, let's say we can solve these problems and we start throwing money at the educational system, and we start pumping cash into public schools and the universities. Uh, it's really easy to churn out technicians. We could churn out, again, another assembly line of people who are qualified to do protocol X, Y, and Z over and over and over again. But that's different from being a scientist. So how do we shape an educational system to promote science thinking rather than technical problem solving? And finally, um, I gotta mention this as, as an atheist, how can we blunt the influence of religion and football on science education, and I will refuse to tolerate any jo jokes about how religion is, or how football is a religion. It is not. There's a big difference. There are atheists who are football fans or hockey fans, and we don't sit there and say, "Oh, well, you're just a, you're just religious." There, there's actually a whole suite of very different impulses in people beyond just religion. There's lots of other interests. How do we get around the problem that sometimes these conflict with science teaching? Okay, I will stop there, and you guys are going to tell me the answers, right? Yeah, okay, good. This, this is great. This is going to be very helpful. And then I'll go back and tell the American electorate what to do.